Welcome. This is Christian Haynes with Gamers with Glasses, and we've also got Roger Whitson and Brian Rejack for Gamers with Glasses. And we're going to be having a spoiler-filled discussion of Sucker Punch's game, uh, Ghost of Tsushima, their action, combat-centered role-playing game from just this past summer 2020. Uh, so I think from here, we're going to just jump right into the conversation. So why don't we start by talking about the story? Anybody want to jump in? Uh, yeah, I'll, oh, okay, Roger, it's all you. No, go ahead. <laughs> so, yeah, we're, we're in, uh, 1274 on the island of Tsushima. Uh, just off the coast of the mainland. Um, uh, and there's an invasion from the Mongol Empire. Basically, their attempt was to invade this island and then from there stage an invasion of uh, the mainland of Japan. And we play as Jin Sakai, um, who is a samurai and sort of the adopted son of Lord Shimura. And it begins with all the samurai, more or less, getting killed in a battle against um, Koten Khan. And uh, as Jin Sakai, then we have to sort of build ourselves back up again, learn a, a new way of fighting, the way of the ghost. Um, and so we've got this tension between his training as a samurai and his, his uncle slash adopted father, um, his samurai approach, and uh, Jin has to try something else. So that's basically the, the setup from the beginning. I don't know. Did I miss anything yeah. crucial there? No. And Just the word ninja. <laughs> Oh, right, right. Sorry. Like he's he's got to <laughs> learn to be a ninja. So if if it wasn't cool enough that you get to be a samurai, you also get to be a ninja, and it's the push and pull between samurai and ninja. Do they ever use the word? It's interesting. Do they ever use the word ninja in the game? You know? I doubt it. Yeah, yeah, I don't think so. I wonder if if that has anything to do with. Um, uh, anachronism or a desire to avoid it. I don't, I mean, I don't know anything about the timeline of the origin of that, that word, but could be. Yeah. I mean, it's very interesting. I found the, you know, I wasn't going to play this game uh, initially. I was like, oh, you know, another game, who cares? But like, once I saw the first, uh, the first cutscene, right, right before the battle, um, and Kotun Khan, uh, lighting that guy on fire, right? Like I was like, <laughs> whoa, like that's what really sort of, it was It was the cutscene and the narrative that really drew me into the game. So probably more than anything, that's my favorite part of this game. The narrative or the lighting part? on fire of that one guy? I would say the, the story is, um, oh, okay. because I think it's a very compelling, I mean, it's, you know, you talk, talk to us about how it's, you know, uh, influenced quite heavily by Kurosawa, very Shakespearean, in its in its uh, you know discussion of uh, hubris, right? The hubris of the of the uncle and the and the um, if the son is gonna you know betray the uncle or not, and the consequences, and you know it's it's very it's very much in that tradition, I think. So. Right. I mean, so Kurosawa being you know one of the most famous Japanese filmmakers obvious influence on the game to the point where they put in a uh, Kurosawa mode that's black and white with red accents and if I'm remembering correctly got the blessing of this Kurosawa family uh, for using that and for using his name in the marketing and in the Kurosawa mode um, and so there's I mean it's notable because there's a real kind of like I don't want to say a heavy handedness, but a kind of ceremonial quality to how the game presents 
a lot of its story beats, right? Like some of it's just its use of color. Some of it's those moments where it slows down and makes you watch a character's like slow walk towards another character or the close up on hands and duels and just even the use of duels, right? That kind of mm -hmm. moment where you're going to kind of like slow down. It's just going to be you and this other guy and you're going to go at it. Yeah, it's very I'll, cinematic. Uh, yeah, I, I would I would go so far as to say heavy handed, though, I think, um, especially as as you make your way through the game, I think that stuff becomes less and less effective through its repetition and overuse, um, which is, you know, it's always sort of an issue with um, how these open world games work with all these different missions that end up feeling like more or less the same thing. And I think the um, the indebtedness to this, it's almost like to an idea of Kurosawa rather than actually to Kurosawa. Um, it, it starts to feel a little, uh, yeah, a little heavy handed, I think. It, it is interesting how that sense of the open world game with its, like you said, its repetitive elements sort of pulls away from the effectiveness of the narrative, right? Like, so if, we could imagine maybe a much more tightly controlled game in which that story was very more, much more focused in terms of the combat and all of those things and have it maybe have a much more effective uh, impact in terms of the narrative, uh, you know, aspects of it. It's interesting. How much do you think uh, is that sense of heavy handedness and repetition? How much do you think that's, because of the numerous side quests, the tales, uh, the mythic tales. I mean, I don't know about you guys, but I got to this point where I think the first act, the game has three acts, right? Uh, the first act, I was doing lots of side quests, lots of mythic tales. Uh, I was running around helping every peasant I saw. If, if, as soon as a fox appeared, I followed it. If the bird appeared, I followed it. Uh, by the time I got to act three, I think maybe I did one side quest. I was just kind of rushing to end the game. And not even because I didn't want to like see where the story went, but precisely because I just felt like there was so much filler and like so much bloat. Um, and I wanted that pure experience of the drama, the story. Mm -hmm. I agree with that completely. I had the, a very similar uh, experience playing it um and in fact i got there was a point when i was playing it where i was getting sick of doing all the side missions but kind of forcing myself to do it just so that i could get all of all of the charms and all of the um you know all of the all of the other materials you can get um but what's fascinating to me is like how many of those things didn't have an impact on the gameplay or or the story or like you could get like it was just a bunch of like extra like headbands or um, just a lot of aesthetic things, which is fine. Um, but I think it does lead to that sense with a lot of players, if you're not a total completionist, that if the stuff isn't essential, why do it kind of thing. Yeah, I, I had very similar experience where early on I was doing lots of different things. I, you know, was trying to, again, save everything peasant I came across, as Christian said. Um, but yeah, as I went through, I, I think this is this is an issue with open world games more broadly, where um, so much of the appeal of, of any sort of open world game in this mold is novelty, right? Mm -hmm. It's like you enter into this um, imaginative space and you have all these things you can do and it's like yeah oh I want to chase that fox so I can get whatever it is the fox gives us I forget exactly um, and pet the fox like I always wanted to pet the fox and then sometimes when I wasn't allowed to pet the fox I was very upset I think um, you're actually a horrible human being if you don't stop the pet the fox right I know like, but that's how the game measures your honor <laughs> It's okay. true, it's true. But there were times when I would go to the shrine and then I turned to pet the fox and he's not there. I felt so robbed. No. But anyway, <laughs> right, I think the 
when when the novelty is the only thing that um, is the appeal, then it only works for so long, right? Mm -hmm. And eventually, you know, you're just following another fox, and it's uh, not really doing that much for you. Otherwise, I think the the haiku is another good example. So there are these spots you can find where you sit and contemplate a scene and uh, you have sort of three different things that you look at and you compose a haiku by by doing that. It's a really cool novel thing the first time or two. Um, after that, you know, I felt sort of like, do I really need to sit and write another haiku. <laughs> uh, it's not, it's giving me a new headband. I'm not wearing any of these headbands. It just felt like, you know, busy work, basically. Mm -hmm. Me, one of the things that the game could have done, almost does, but doesn't manage to do, is offer you these like meditative experiences that are just about dwelling in, dwelling on a landscape. It sort of does with the photo mode, which we'll get to at some point, I think, in our discussion. But, you know, you have those haikus where you're sort of pausing. And I, and I did like that pause, like you said, Brian, the first handful of times. Mm -hmm. But then there was something about like the go here, go there, flip the map open, uh, follow the trail of the wind, uh, just constantly going from the one point to the next point, because there were so many quests uh, that it, it sort of robbed that meditative quality mm -hmm. for me. I mean, sometimes I could find it, and sometimes I would just play for a while and look out over cliffs and just sit in the photo mode and just take different pictures from different angles with different lighting. Um, I think my first time, you know, they have those shrine missions where you have to like do some platforming to get up a mountaintop usually. And then the first one of those that I had, which was in act one along the coast, was still one of the best experiences I had in the game because it was just like these amazing sort of scenes of like the beach and the water crashing against the cliffs and just narrowly jumping from one tree branch to another with like a 200 foot drop below. And those were the moments in the game that like really stood out to me, not necessarily any one quest. It was just like this landscape. Mm. Yeah, I think, I think it's interesting too, though, that um, the open world game kind of there's a way in which this game invites you to do certain things, but doesn't require you to do it. And I think Maybe that's okay, maybe it's okay, but I think it takes away from some of those things that you would otherwise experience. And so I think I'm gonna constantly compare this to Sekiro or Dark Souls or anything, just because it's my, even though this isn't a very Souls-like game, it's kind of my point of comparison. But like, I'm thinking of, you know, there in, in Dark Souls often, you'll get this sort of vast expansive uh, kind of pan of a, of a, of a landscape, right? after you'll get this after you've been underground for like two or three levels right and you'll just come up and you won't expect it and it's almost like the world explodes into this beautiful kind of shot right and um so like part of the reason like those moments in souls games are so powerful is because you've been emotionally and uh you know physically kind of in the pit of the world for such a long period of time that when you get out into this vast expanse, it's like you feel like you can breathe on several mm -hmm. levels. Um, and I felt like one of the things that sort of takes away from that in an open world game is that you don't have to do that. Like you don't have to go through that in order to get this beautiful scene. And you might not, you might see it the first time you see it, right? But you very quickly become accustomed to just seeing this stuff and I think it takes away some of its impact. You needed dungeons is what you needed, yeah. right? <laughs> you, you, needed, right. you needed the moment where you walk out of the sewer in oblivion at the beginning or something, you know, right. and the freedom yeah. presented to you like a gift. Yeah. Uh, yeah, no, I mean, there's a way in which maybe this goes back to the curious salad. This game is almost too beautiful for its own good. 
-hmm. by which I mean like it sometimes it does feel like you're just inhabiting a landscape painting mm -hmm. uh, and that there's not that contrast within the acts uh, from one moment to the next in the landscape there is between the acts right like it progressively gets grayer and darker from act one through act three. You get like a little gray in act two and then act three is your snow level. And so everything's white and gray, um, the touches of blue. Mm -hmm. But there's like something missing in terms of contrast. It's all bright and beautiful for most of the game. And even when it gets gray, it's a beautiful gray and a beautiful white. Right, totally. Yeah, I think I'm I'm with you on that. That it's like it's too much beauty. We <laughs> are just overwhelmed. And I mean, it's a credit to to the game, right? That they created this amazingly beautiful world. Um, but yeah, I think it, it does become sort of um, uh, you just yeah you get used to it because that's all all you have. You never have that moment where you're longing to finally get out of the dungeon and are, are greeted with some grand vista. It's just grand vistas all the way. So you brought up uh, Sekiro, Roger, but I think we should talk about the other two uh, open world elephants in the room when we're talking about just open worlds these days. One is obviously Ubisoft and the sort of Ubisoftification of open world games. And the other, I would say, is Breath of the Wild. Um, and this is much more obviously indebted to Ubisoft, even down to just the sheer number of icons on the map uh, when you open the map. You don't have to, right? Like, the idea is that you could just follow the wind from quest to quest, though I have to admit that I didn't always find that all that effective and that sometimes I would just open the map and then open the map again and then open the map again. And, you know, I, I do feel like in a lot of video game criticism and conversation, it's hard not to measure things against Breath of the Wild in some way and precisely mm -hmm. against Breath of the Wild's ability to just let you explore and let you have an encounter, well, with a vista, with a view that doesn't, that's interesting, but doesn't seem determined by a quest, doesn't seem like hooked into any like specific requirement or skill-based sort of benchmark or anything. Um, and yeah, and we, you know, we, we mentioned, you know, before we started getting talking about how effective the open world here is at telling the story. And maybe we could talk a little bit more about the relationship between like the open world and the story and where the story goes. Hmm. Yeah, well, I, I, uh, I hate to admit this, but I've never played Breath of the Wild. So I understand hmm. if you want to kick me off. Yeah, I'm um, actually just looking for the mute <laughs> button now. Yeah. But uh, I have played a lot of Assassin's Creed games. Um, and uh, I think there are there are a lot of ways in which um, this game, Ghost of Tsushima, um, you know, falls into some of the, 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 I don't know if deficient, I wouldn't say deficiency is, is that's a little too extreme, but the, the limitations of um, the Ubisoft model where, you know, you get all these side quests and part of the, the joy is just feeling like you've got this rich, varied, large world with lots of stuff to do. But as you move through things, it ends up being you know, sort of the same thing over and over again and gets rather tedious. So one of the the main kinds of missions that you come across again and again is you've got these peasants who've been, had their villages taken over by the invading Mongols or, you know, some something has happened and you have to go and try and rectify that wrong, whether it's saving somebody or, um, you know, so those get a little tiresome at times, I think. But I will say in, in defense of the narrative effectiveness, there are some moments that I think are really striking and touching uh, in terms of the, the way that the, the story is told and just the, 
the content of the these little narrative vignettes that we get as well. So for me, the exemplary one of, of that kind is um, at the, I believe it's the beginning of act two, you meet this older woman named Yuriko who was um, Jin's caretaker when he was growing up. And she, uh, in, in terms of the main storyline, her purpose is basically to teach him how to use poison. So it's um, teaching him this method outside of his, his former samurai code of honor. Um, but in the process, she also uh, herself tells, you know, this narrative of, of her life when she was younger and reminds Jin of his childhood and everything. Um, but what I love about that sequence is that you begin with a main mission where you have to follow her. And when you end that main mission, you end right at the spot where you can start an optional mission with her. Um, and then when you do that optional mission, you end at the start of the next optional mission you can do with her. And so this linking of missions there, it was the one time in the game where I felt like really compelled. I wanted to follow this storyline through. And part of it was just that the game was clearly encouraging me to do that um, because of how it structured the beginning and endings of, of those missions. And spoiler alert, but she's an old woman and you basically sort of watch her slowly deteriorate over the course of those three missions. And then she dies at the end of the third mission. Um, but she's, you know, reminiscing on her past and she thinks Jin is Jin's father and she's remembering this moment that she had with Jin's father. Um, and it seems like she was in love with Jin's father and there's just, you know, all this really fraught, um, uh fraught but like quiet too it's a quiet moment in the game you barely do any killing in those across those three missions um and so to me it felt like the the narrative moment that was the best at capturing that kind of meditative slowing that christian you talked about um trying to seek out in mm. other ways in the game besides the the missions I find that, um, so I've actually played Breath of the Wild, but not Assassin's Creed. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm on the opposite end. But I think one of the things that Breath of the Wild has going for it is probably that its story isn't as compelling. Like, it, the story is kind of like it being the upteenth Zelda game, right? Like, the story is just kind of like any Zelda game. Um, you're going to get stuff to go defeat Ganon and it's a little different because there's you know like any Zelda game there's a little bit of a difference to it but ultimately the story doesn't really matter and so it's more about I mean I remember I remember how anticlimactic it felt to do the major uh I'm not I'm forgetting what they were called but like the major like uh spaces the boss where dungeons yeah yeah the boss dungeons like where you like you're one you're in like a like a uh, underwater kind of thing and one you're in like the the volcano people the gorons right like and then another you're you're somewhere you're somewhere else and they're all like elemental and it's okay but it's a little anticlimactic um the actually the the it's more of even in even in those story missions though i think the most interesting part is like when you go into these like each 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 of the dungeons have has like a sort of mechanical uh animal kind of thing and those are themselves these dungeons that you go into and i remember just the exploration part of it and like figuring out the puzzle was much more interesting than the narrative itself and so i actually completed a lot of that game i didn't finish all of it but um you know i think because that game is so much more about, you know, exploration and puzzles than the narrative. In some ways, like, I ignore the narrative much more in that game than I do in Ghost of Tsushima, where it's like, it's always on my mind. And I'm like, okay, I, I really want to get back to this really cool story, but I got to go, you know, get this stupid charm. Like, like, it's kind of, it becomes, there's a tension between open worldness i think and the story in ghost of tsushima that isn't in breath of the wild um 
So that's my sense of it anyway. Yeah, it's almost like a difference between like Breath of the Wild is quiet in the sense that there's an absence of story. When Ghost of Tsushima is quiet, it's quiet because it actually has quiet or muted story beats, which I actually appreciated, right? Like I appreciated, this is one of the few games where you see middle-aged and older characters playing an important role. Mm -hmm. uh, they never lean too hard into romance and the romances that are significant in the game are almost always in the past, right? Like they're romances that have already occurred. Just kind of melancholy, quiet quality to everything. And even, you know, my favorite character in the game was Yuna, this character that, you know, after the battle that begins the game that you lose, that the samurai lose, she fishes you out of the water, she saves you, helps heal you and then sets you on your way. She's also the person that introduces you to the ninja mechanics, the assassin mechanics, the silent, whatever you want to call them mechanics. But they never turn the friendship between Yuna, who's a woman, and Jin, who's a man, into some kind of easy romance like they could have. I feel like there were moments where I could almost see where they were tempted to, right? Yeah. There were moments where it's was like, oh, okay, here's the kiss. Um, <laughs> You know, probably no Mass Effect style going to bed, but like, here's going to be the kiss. And they never did it. And they always just leaned into friendships. Like, friend, this was a game about friendships and about people uniting in hard times. It was also a game about class differences and about Jin reckoning with his own status as an aristocrat um, and engaging with people who were peasants, who were of the lower classes and who like would call him out at times. And I'm not sure if the game was like some kind of effective interrogation of class uh, or a state, you know, I, it doesn't quite manage that because at the end of the day, you are the hero. And at the end of the day, what you're doing is shoring up the system uh, and shoring up a feudal system where there are going to be lords and peasants. On the other hand, it does have moments where it makes you ask questions about political relationships, class relationships, and it does so through those friendships, through those relationships you develop with folks like, you know, through Yuna, through Ryuzo, um, even through your sort of antagonism with Khan. Mm -hmm. And so I did appreciate yeah. that. I, I was thinking about that as well, the, the focus on friendship and, and the, um, especially with Yuna, right? Like at the beginning I thought, okay, clearly this is gonna end up being a, a romance plot. And I, I really liked that they resisted that easy move. And there, there are also a couple close friendships with, as you say, like older people. Lady Adachi is one. I really like her character where her, her whole family has basically been killed and she's on a quest to avenge their deaths. Um, but there are a couple really nice quiet moments between her and Jin um, that that I I thought were particularly effective. Um, so yeah, I think I think that's a good point about the the focus on friendship and how that fits into the larger political and class tensions that are being investigated. If ultimately by the end of the game still just held up as, you know, the same. I'm reminded of the very end, um, somewhat of the very end where Lord Shimura wants to make Jin his son, right? Um, and I'm, I, I was, I, I don't know exactly, I've, I've been trying to think about why they decided to make Shimura the uncle. Perhaps they're just to introduce this sense of that he's not quite, uh, legitimate or, or or whatever and that that creates kind of this 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 tension between friendship and family that i think is part part of what's going on throughout the entire story as both of you pointed out really well um you know how do you how so so but what what struck me is like by the time that uh i think that dilemma comes up i already don't care about being his son like i don't want to be his son right like i'm 
I'm already like so far along on this quest of being the ghost and, um, you know, recognizing that people now like look up to me, right? As And there's like folk songs in me being the player, uh, being uh, Jin Sakai, um, that like that, for whatever reason, that sort of thing, which should be sort of the culmination of his narrative as a samurai, right? When he's actually invited into the noble family, um, just hits so, uh, it, it, it just sort of uh, is, is, is completely hollow, right? Like it's not, it's not um, compelling at all. And so, um, yeah, I think it's really fascinating to conceptualize that even though it's still holding up this feudal system, it's doing so, I think, in a way that is interesting, um, particularly in terms of like um, questioning these types of bonds that are taken for granted at the beginning. Yeah, I mean, it's a super Oedipal game. It's a game about expectations from parents and about adopted parents and like how they see you. And I mean, that's the you know, internal conflict or strife for Jin is just, he wants that recognition from his uncle and you know, he wants him to be proud of him. And at the same time, he's looking at like the material realities of what's going on, which starts off just being like, we can't defeat the Mongols. Like we have been, we can't keep fighting like samurai and actually fend off this invasion. But then it becomes also not only that, but maybe things were already messed up to begin with. Maybe this entire structure in which like, all the peasants are at our service was a little messed up. Um, on the other hand, they're still just waiting NPCs that are just so happy to see you um, and crying and yelling to you. And um, yeah, how many times are do you like? I just I it, it's it's such a funny uh, set of like images where you're rescuing them from the Mongols and and cutting open their their restraints or their rope restraints and they all say their little line like oh thank you oh and it's it's just a it's just repeated over and over and over again so i kept on thinking of that like uh george costanza moment in seinfeld where he says you can stuff your sorries in a sack but i was like you can stuff your thank yous in a sack <laughs> especially you know you have that moment where you think you've cleared out the enemies and you try to free them and they're like no there's still an enemy nearby and you have to go hunt down the one enemy whose ai is malfunctioning so they're off in a corner like that you know like yeah. in the playground eating paste or something <laughs> i'm just that like come on. or he, they're in one room that the one room that you haven't you haven't fully explored or that you yeah. just kind of ran through but didn't yeah. you hear all of the people I stabbed? You know, <laughs> like, come <laughs> on. Um, which, we should talk about combat. We haven't talked about the combat mechanics. We haven't talked about, you know, the different sort of skills that go along with being like the ghost versus being the samurai and how people felt about the sand shifts and all that. So I can, sorry, okay, okay sorry. Okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah uh, so the just to give a sense of the the basic rundown of what what the combat involves. So you've got these four different stances by the end of the game that you you learn, and each stance is um, effective against a particular kind or class of enemies. Um, and you know it it works pretty well as a a form of challenge, so that. You know, you're in a group fighting four or five guys, and one has a shield and one has a spear, and you've got to know which stance to use to to move between it. But there's also you you have a lot of tricks at your disposal, um, especially as you progress and get more skills, uh, that makes it possible for you to be pretty bad at combat and still do just fine in the game. Like you That's don't me. really have to get <laughs> get that good at mastering switching between the stances and parrying and dodging and um you can also just like start to get beat up on and then throw a smoke bomb and assassinate three guys uh so i i had played this not that long after i finally played sekiro and i felt like in sekiro i had to really learn how to master the combat skills in that game in order to just get through it like there's no way you can really 
um, just have a, a crutch, uh, like a, a smoke bomb or, you know, the other things that, that Jin has in this game. Um, and so once I came into the Ghost of Tsushima, I, I, I don't know, I felt sort of let down. I like wanted a challenge to be thrown at me that I would have to really um, dig in and, and work to overcome. And it is challenging at times, but it gives you a lot of ways through that challenge other than painstaking disciplined study like you need mm -hmm. to adopt in uh, the Souls-like games. Yeah, I'm reminded, I the only time that I, and I, the only time I remember having kind of that panic attack of desperation that you get often in Souls games and definitely in Sekiro. I think Sekiro in some ways is probably, it might be the hardest game of the Souls franchise. Um, you know, but every time, so I remember, by the way, I also remember in Sekiro uh, going up against the, the, the uh, I guess it's the orc the first time is it the orc the guy who's chained oh and... yeah i don't know what they're called but the guy who has like that bell that he puts yeah. over your oh, oh no 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 okay. sorry you're talking about the really giant i mean thing. the i mean the giant guy that you have to defeat yeah. with uh fire right and you have right. to go on this whole other like side quest to get the actual prosthetic to go then and be defeat him and it's and 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 then you end up realizing that he's not even really a boss he's just a sub boss and you're like oh come on <laughs> come on are you kidding me right and uh so like i never really had that feeling in in ghost of tsushima um i could tell there were little i think uh you know maybe maybe they were they were gesturing to souls fans in different times with like the perfect parry system you can you can like I really loved parrying uh, like little the Ronin that you have to fight or uh, the bosses, um, and I love the fact that that was kind of the most effective way to defeat them. Um, so so there was there were elements of that in there, but like the only time I felt that familiar Souls panic was when you're on the mountain um, and you have to get up to the top of this mountain to learn some technique. Um, and the mountain is, there's, there's a snowstorm going on and you have to make it to certain uh, benchmarks before you freeze. You freeze very fast. Um, and so I would frequently, because of it being an open world game, it's not always obvious where you're supposed to go. Um, and I remember so many times like not making it, freezing to death and being like, I don't even know where to go. I don't know where to go. Like that would become my yell. Um, so there was that, a little bit of that there, which was nice. Um, but certainly, you know, and, and I don't think that this game tries to be Sekiro. So I think, I think it's totally fine that it, it's not, you know, the same type of combat experience. Um, I feel like there's a lot to it that's quite deep. Um, but uh, yeah, it does, it doesn't, it doesn't give you the same feeling. For me, with the sword play, it reminded me a lot of Team Ninja's 3D Ninja Gaidens, uh, if a little slower, to be honest. Uh, but the same and easier the, and I and think... easier, yeah. Um, although I always found the 3D Ninja Gaidens to be much easier than the Dark Souls uh, games and the Soulsborne games. Um, and maybe it's just because I played them earlier or something, and just was more used to them. But there, there is a quality to like you're constantly dealing with multiple uh, enemies at once, but you seldom really feel overwhelmed. There's always it's always pretty easy to get out of the way, and you never feel locked into combat if you don't want to be. And then you get a, all the ghost skills, right? The smoke bombs, the exploding arrows, uh, the blow darts that make your enemies hallucinate and attack one another by the end of the game. <laughs> Uh, and you can just get so cheap. So I just like, I yeah. decimated them uh, before even going into the camps. So I would just say be like half their health would be gone and I would just go in and just stab them, you know, <laughs> mostly from behind every once in a while, you know, I would actually fight them. Uh, but usually I was just taking cheap shots from roofs and like just taking them out. Uh, 
And I always felt like the story was justifying me doing that too. It's like, yeah, yeah I'm becoming yeah. the ghost. I'm falling from grace, uh, down with the samurai. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, there there were moments where I was like, okay, I'm gonna take out another camp, and it's gonna go pretty similarly to the last camp because I'm gonna blow up everything first, <laughs> and then make them attack each other, and then I'm just gonna stab them to death, and that's fine. Uh, and it's still fun, but it's fun kind of like eating a bucket of popcorn shrimp or something, you know? It's just yeah. like okay, I just ate thirty of these poor little creatures, and I'm still hungry. Um, yeah, you don't feel good about yourself yeah. after. Yeah. And, and there's no like boss fights that are punctuating things. There are boss fights, but they never even feel yeah. like these momentous boss fights. They're not like the sort of towering enemies in a Dark Souls or a Bloodborne. Uh, well, and I feel like even the final boss, even uh, even Kotun Khan, when you're fighting him, the thing that was annoying about that fight wasn't. Kotun Khan, like he wasn't that bad. It was like that he kept summoning an infinite number of stupid people to come after you. So I always, I have this thing about, and it's not just in, it, so there's some souls enemies that do this, but I think it's fine that if you want to summon extra enemies when you're fighting, <laughs> but I think sometimes it can be kind of a cheap tactic to not design uh, an interesting boss too, right? Um, cause like when I fight a boss, I want there to be a certain, uh, intimacy in like how we read one another and how that sort of dance happens. Right. And I didn't feel that at all with Kotu Khan. So it was unfortunate. I mean, the closest thing that felt like good boss battles were the duels. And I almost wonder, would the game have been better if they would have just stuck to duels and actually not done anything that resembles throwing in new game mechanics for bosses just like have them be duels have their reflexes be a little quicker so your reflexes have to be a little quicker but just let that like ceremonial m moment when you sort of you have to zoom into your hands you know it's first it zooms into their hand and then your hand and then like you see each other staring at each other and then there is this sort of like you know kind of like face off moment and then you fight and you circle each other nobody else is involved uh, you have these beautiful landscapes in the background, sometimes a waterfall, sometimes a cliffside, mm -hmm. and you just go one on one for a few minutes at the very least. And you know, you parry and you keep parrying until you just get that perfect opening, uh, enough times to end the combat. Like, that's what I wanted, and I love those moments. Um, and I love those moments, even though they probably took me like five times, you know, more attempts than it did for you guys like i there was the one in particular the like the sort of weird moment when they flirted with the occult when you were getting the longbow and it seemed like you were fighting a demon uh right. which i think is gesturing towards the dlc the free dlc that they're about to put out with like co-op which we should the three of us should try to play this together uh maybe do like a little <laughs> video of us because that's apparently you're fighting demons Oh wow! That, ah. But that moment, like when I was fighting this demon, it took me like 20 times, which is sure enough, but I was still getting the parry window down mm -hmm. um, because I'm not great at parrying. Yeah. And it, but it was so satisfying when I yeah. finally won and it felt good to keep on doing it. Which also one last thing. So the first game that Sucker Punch does for the PS4 is uh, Infamous Second Son, uh, which is a fine game. I played like half of it and it was good enough, whatever. I will say one notable thing about this game, which is coming right at the you know end of the life cycle of this console, is it's a technical masterpiece. Mm -hmm. The load times, even on the base PS4, which I don't have the PS4 Pro, but on the base PS4, the load times are better than almost any other game. The only game that compares is another end of generation game, Last of Us Part Two. Like these are the... I don't know if like Sony, because he's our first part, party studio, gave them like the secret keys to like the hardware. <laughs> but th they just like 15 second load times for fast traveling. They shouldn't be able to do that. Or at least, very least, everybody else should have been able to do it, but weren't. Yeah, <laughs> yeah no, that's that's a great point. It really is. The, um, the fast travel was very nice, especially later in the game when I was getting kind of tired of doing all these side quests and... I just wanted to kind of get moving, uh, get things over with. <laughs> uh, 
the fast travel was nice and the fact that it really was fast uh is is definitely a technical achievement given it's a it's a pretty large area that uh, the game covers mm, definitely absolutely so how did you guys feel about the code of honor that was a big part of the marketing plan do you think it actually became a game mechanic at all and i'm thinking about this because sucker punch has made it more of a game mechanic with like a morality system and all of us are familiar probably with some version of bioware's morality system uh and it didn't i gotta admit for me like it was obviously part of the story but it never felt like it was a mechanical part of the game uh except just tangentially yeah i'm i'm with you it it felt like um it really made no difference in terms of how you played the game. Um, it wasn't like, you know, you could only earn some skills if you played in this way and other skills in another way. You just got everything and you could do whatever you want. And um, nothing, there was also nothing in terms of the gameplay that really discouraged you from being what the game narrative considered dishonorable. Right, mm -hmm. and I think when you've got these morality systems, I think that that can be a really interesting tension that arises. Where at the narrative level, you have this tension that also plays out on the gameplay level. Mm -hmm. And I think when systems like that fail, it's when it's only working at the narrative level. And it definitely felt like that was the case here, where you know Jin is feeling conflicted about um, taking up these these other methods. Uh, in the narrative but you know there's nothing in the playing of the game that's like suggesting to you that maybe that's a bad thing that you're doing it was yeah. the game just says like here are all your tools have fun which is fine right like i'm glad that we got all those fun things to play with but it didn't didn't line up with the narrative tension in a way that i think it could have done in an interesting way well, and I, I'm thinking of uh, a recent game that I have not played, but I've heard does really well with the morality system, and that's Wasteland 3, hmm. um, in which, you know, you have to, like, deal with warlords who might be kind of messed up in some ways, but um, the only alternative is, you know, maybe one of your... He comes after you, maybe some of your party members die, right? Like, and so having real consequences associated with that would have been really interesting. And I think there would have been pr relatively easy ways to do that. I, I, I find it, you know, I think they could have made it so that maybe peasants wouldn't have trusted you as much mm -hmm. once you started uh, going down the path of the ninja, right? Like it would have been harder to like, to like get, get uh, aid from them. Um, and so, uh yeah like it, it's interesting to me that like not only is it not sort of in the mechanics itself but i don't i don't sense that i don't know i i don't know how you would finish the game as a samurai like it would be kind of interesting to see if that was even possible but i feel i sense that it isn't i sense that you always have to like you know at least try some of these methods or like earn the uh distrust of your of your uncle right no matter what you do and so that's another aspect of it that's a little difficult uh to wrestle with like if we were actually wrestling with that those different honor codes as a part of how to play this game and how to get through this game it would have been really interesting i wonder if the irony here isn't that part of this is a problem with this being a triple a game a big budget game where the more story content you pump out, the more video rendering you have to do, the more animation work that's required. I mean, Wasteland 3, which if I'm remembering it is in exile, uh, here we're, it's the same team that made the first two fallouts, which were also isometric role-playing games. Like it, they're isometric role-playing games that are just a graphics rendering and animation work are much more limited and, and they're a much smaller team but where they put their energy and their efforts are in writing dialogue and the dialogue i have i've played maybe five hours of the game because it's on game pass because i have game pass uh 
and they put their effort into like typed up dialogue right some of it's recorded but a lot of it's not um and so part of the problem here is i think they had a kind of like a budget balancing problem and then they also had a gameplay balancing problem which is i'm sure they asked themselves how do we balance these two different play styles maybe they even tried to and maybe it wasn't balanced actually the, the game this makes me think of which is a game that i found infuriating because of this was a game called vampire put out mm -hmm. by don't nod a few years ago uh the same studio that did life is strange in that game you're a vampire from the beginning and to level up and to get more powers you have to drain the life from npcs but if you drain the life from npcs they grow angry with you and the neighborhoods like fall into disrepair but they made the combat a little bit too hard about halfway through that game there were just a couple boss encounters that i think most people felt were just a little bit much and part of the problem, though, is you could go into those being like, I'm trying to be a goody two-shoes. I don't want to suck everybody's blood, so I'm just going <laughs> to, you know, like go into this underpowered and get my uh, butt kicked. And, you know, so I think they could have ended up, you know, Ghost of Tsushima could have ended up in a similar problem. Uh, but on the other hand, maybe if they had, it still would have been more interesting, <laughs> you know? And I say this, and it's a game that I like. It's a game I really enjoyed, right. and I don't finish every game. I finish this game. I think I finish at this point like 10% of the games I play because I almost rather play more games for less time sometimes um, just because I like mechanics. I like playing with the mechanics of different games. And I do wish they would have been a little more daring and a little more experimental at points. On the other hand, in some of the aesthetic styles and some of what they did with even just like the photo mode being so central and things like that, there, there was some experimentation. I don't want to give them credit for that. Um, and, and maybe this can, just because we don't want to run too long, but maybe this can bring us to our last discussion. Uh, you know, when we think about like, development and what sucker punch has done as a studio and just acknowledge the fact this is a very different game for them most of their games are set in the u.s in a fictionalized version of the u.s but the u.s nonetheless in seattle and new orleans uh i forget where the first infamous is set uh maybe dc uh but it's definitely i think a u.s location and then they jumped to japan and they did their research i knew there was a lot of going to japan uh for research trips they took a lot of photographs for animation reference uh they hired scholars to consult uh there were at least a few people hired as consulting um but as people have pointed out there are plenty of anachronisms and we've already talked about you know there's a way in which they're trying to do kurosawa and that's as important as any kind of historical accuracy is but I'm wondering how folks are feeling about this very U.S., this very American studio doing this game about, what is it, a 13th century Japan? Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, set in 1274, uh, a feudal Japan. Uh, and how we feel like it handles that, because there have been questions, right, just to sort of not leave any cards face down. There have been questions raised about cultural appropriation. There's been questions raised about whether or not this plays into contemporary right-wing politics in Japan, which has had a sort of resurgent right-wing movement, though it seems kind of distinct and different from say the European or American right-wing movements we've seen. Um, and so I, I'm just wondering how you guys felt about it and what you were taking away, how you felt about the discourse surrounding stuff. The first thing that sort of hit me when I saw this, uh, when I started playing was that uh, the default language is English. And in fact, if you like, I really wanted to play it in Japanese with English subtitles, right? If you, but if you have them speak in Japanese, they look like they're, they're definitely mouthing in English, right? And so it's like an inverse kind of problem that a lot of American, uh, I think, uh, people growing up on anime and Kurosawa films had, which was, which was with the dubs, right? Um, so it, that I found that to be really revealing to me in terms of like the background of Sucker Punch and and these questions. Um, I think that uh, yeah, like I think that this this whole narrative of the samurai and the and the ninja 
all of it is really fascinating, um, particularly in terms of what you talked about, Christian, uh, the sort of nationalist resurgence and the sort of, you know, this kind of like love of the past that you see occurring in this story, right? Um, this is a moment of great change, presumably, too, that's occurring. And yet um, you do see a kind of, uh, a kind of romance of the samurai, even though they're shown that their, their methods are wrong. And so I think that there's definitely a kind of nostalgia that could easily be appropriated by all kinds of political discourses um, in terms of like, you know, the code of honor that's, that's established that, that even though you don't fully uh, agree with it, right? Um, I think there are elements of it you still engage with. Um, so yeah, this is a, it's, 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 it's a very fascinating game in those, in those contexts. Yeah, the analogy oh. that jumps to mind for me is sort of like the way Reagan used cowboys, right? <laughs> you know, it's just like, I don't know what Trump uses. I just, you know, a stream of endless lies. But uh, but Reagan had that cowboy figure that he had played in the movies and the cow, you know, the relationship between the cowboy and the samurai is talked about a lot. But these figures of honor that sort of ride off into the sunset and, you know, which are really useful for a kind of right-wing politics that's invested in sort of rugged independence and the individual making the decision to save the people and riding the town to save the people from their own, you know, foibles, their own problems. Uh, and so I do, I worry about that. I worry because obviously you can do that and still have a critical take. I think Red Dead Redemption 2 in particular is a really sort of masterful kind of send up or like take down of the cowboy and remembering the kind of violence that was part of the our image of the Wild West. But I, I don't know if this game pulls that off or not. What do you think, Brian? Yeah, I, I don't think it really does. I mean, the so I should preface this by saying um, a lot of my thinking about this is from uh, a couple articles on Bullet Points Monthly, which is a, a website um, about gaming. And their August issue had um, four or five pieces about this game. And many of them, many of those pieces touch on these questions about cultural appropriation and the, the links to right-wing nationalism in Japan. Um, and I, I found those pieces to be really compelling and, and insightful readings of the game. So um, one of the things that, that I would say is just uh, something I, I mentioned towards the beginning when we were talking about Kurosawa, which is that um, the game feels at times like a very superficial engagement with um, an idea of what Kurosawa represents as a filmmaker. Um, and, you know, Kurosawa was was doing his own sort of myth making, right? And so you've got this game basically uncritically taking up a surface level reading of that mythologizing and putting it forward without really any significant interrogation, I don't think. And I think that's where stuff gets gets tricky and, and dangerous in terms of the the way it can be appropriated by, um, you know, nationalist right wing audiences. Um, the, the game sort of offers itself up as this historically accurate depiction of like the, the real cultural culture of Japan during this time period. And, you know, the, these real, um, uh, cultural tensions around these different codes of honor. And as far as I can tell from from reading some things about it, it's uh, the game is inaccurate in a lot of ways um, and and sort of reproduces this like late nineteenth century mythologizing of the figure of the samurai um, without you know um, getting into the complexity of the historical reality. But it offers itself up as if, Right, it's like this game that's rooted in all this historical research, and you know they go to 
great lengths to, in these sort of micro level details, try and make things seem accurate, it's easy then for the game to not look like a, a kind of ideological space, but just like the way things are, which is, of course, when ideology is at its most insidious. So, um, you know, it's, I guess that's my, my sort of general take on, on the question. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, one moment that really reminds me of what you say, Brian, is uh, I actually thought, so there's a moment after you first rescue Lord Shimura at the end of act one, and Yuna comes up to you and says, I would like to go home now. Right. And uh, Lord Shimura blocks that and says, well, if you help me take back the island, then I'll let you go home. Right. And so I thought in that moment, it's interesting that like, I felt like, and maybe I didn't follow up on that story enough, but I felt like that narrative was kind of dropped that tension that, that could have brought out kind of like, well, what are the samurai about really? If not like, you know, appropriating people, taking them from their homes, making them fight in wars that they don't want to fight in. But like that, that whole potential thread of critique that could have easily emerged out of that storyline, I thought, I thought it was going to happen, uh, just kind of disappeared. And so, uh, yeah, like I think that there were, there seemed to be different uh, moments where we could have seen something like Red Dead Redemption or some kind of deconstruction of the samurai myth or even of the Kurosawa samurai myth, right? And we just don't, we just don't see that. I don't, I don't think it disappears, Roger, because I actually remember it reappearing a few times, oh, okay. even at the end of the game. Uh -huh. But it lacks intensity, and I don't know how else to put it except to say that when you're talking about Red Dead, it feels like it strikes at like the foundation of the myth in a way, right? Like that the character you're playing is compromised, especially in Red Dead 2, like compromised fundamentally. And the only thing you can do is offer hope to John, who you already know what's going to happen because Red Dead 2 is a prequel. And so you know that there is no saving this myth. Mm -hmm. Ghost of Tsushima offers maybe too much hope. Maybe it's too beautiful. I think it's, it's <laughs> worth noting that, you know, one of the right wing sort of I don't want to say propaganda, but one of the right wing PR kind of slogans was about making Japan beautiful again and about beautiful Japan and national pride. And this was under Shinzo Abe, um, the prime minister, who's I think the longest running prime minister in Japan, in fact. Um, and, you know, it offers critique but it only offers critique in a way where the player can kind of take it if they like and if not that's fine you don't have to pay attention to it uh it's it's inoffensive and i and i have to wonder i don't want to say this is a worry but i, I do wonder to what degree this isn't like part of sucker punch being a kind of like first party stony studio not that sony says don't be too critical not that at all but more just like the games that come out of there, for the most part, maybe Naughty Dog's Last of Us Part Two is an exception, but for the most part, they're these like action games that don't require you to think too much if you don't want to, whether it's God of War or whatever. And, and I love those games. I play them all and I play them all to completion. Uh, but it feels like there's a kind of pulled punch that happens in this game. Um, and I guess to be fair to them, Japan is in a very complex political moment right now. You have an emperor who's, you know, in tensions with the prime minister. The prime minister, from what I remember hearing, is actually trying to make the position of emperor more politically powerful because it serves a kind of right wing myth about Japan, while the emperor is trying to make himself less powerful. And if I remember correctly, is stepping down. Um, which has only happened one other time in Japanese history. And so it's just a weird political moment, but it almost seems like Ghost of Tsushima just kind of erred on the side of safety and aesthetics. You know, like, let's make a beautiful Japan. Don't worry too much about politics. Yeah, it, I think that's right. And the, there's another moment that was really telling for me along those lines. It's towards the very end of the game where Jin is in conflict with 
uh, his uncle, Lord Shimura, and he has to sneak into the castle to leave a note, basically trying to, you know, form an alliance again. And in the process of sneaking into the castle, right, he, he says, you know, oh, I can't kill any of these guards. I got to make sure that I, um, you know, do this stealthily. So it's, right, it's sort of in line with the ghost figure. Um, but, but he says literally, he's like, um, oh, if I kill these guards, then I will be the monster they're making me out to be. And it just seems utterly ridiculous that, like, of course, he's not going to go in and slaughter his own people, right? Like, it's not like he just would immediately, you know, be like, all right, well, it's either samurai code of honor and hanging out with uncle Lord Shimura or kill anyone at any time for any reason, right? Mm -hmm. And that's like, the game sets it up as if that's the conflict. And of course it's not, right? Like, and that's the kind of thing where I think there could be really interesting nuanced stuff that the game was working through with that conflict, but instead it's just like, here's this one extreme that isn't really a thing and here's this other extreme that also isn't really a thing, and they're in conflict. And, you know, what you get is basically, yeah, you just play it and it's like, whatever, all right, I'll go into the castle and stealthily work my way through. But it's, you know, beyond yeah. that, it doesn't really have much to say. I, I find that, like, it, that's flipped when you fight him at the end, right? Where you have the chance to kill him or not. And the dishonorable action is to not kill him, right? right. Which makes sense. <laughs> It makes sense, but it flips that narrative completely in the service of this samurai ideology, right? Which is interesting, even at that moment where you have completely abandoned, right? This kind of this kind of structure. So there's room for a really interesting second game. There's also room for a really interesting spin-off game, which I only mentioned because. Uh, Sucker Punch has done this, I think, at least twice, where they've spun off characters out of the Infamous series into their own games, like shorter games. And man, what I wouldn't do for a Yuna game. Like, oh, what yeah, I wouldn't for sure. do for no more samurai crap, just like <laughs> I'm a thief trying to like survive, just hustling to get by with my brother, who's a blacksmith for some reason. Um, <laughs> and I'm just trying to get by. And it's rough, like I would play that game, right? And I mean, it's worth noting, like at the end of the day, this is a game that's not about revolution or even reform, right? It's not about changing the nation, it's about saving the nation from an outside invader. And I don't know if there is ever a way for that not to become a right wing trope. I mean, mm -hmm. there are instances, but like it's so easy to let the outside invader uh, idea become a way of keeping the system intact. The U.S. has done that with the war on terror. The Soviet Union did that with World War II and the way they sort of mythologized World War II after you know the Battle of Stalingrad. Uh, so, I mean, it falls prey to that. It's not alone. Uh, but I would love to see a second game that really just sees Jin going in another direction and sees maybe instead of having the three-act structure where you're going to different parts of an island, have the three-act structure where the island's actually changing how it works, how the peasants relate to you, how everything's happening from one act to another. Yeah. yeah. Um, and maybe record the VO initially with Japanese voice actors and the lips <laughs> line up. <laughs> Just do yourself a favor and avoid that critique from the beginning. <laughs> oh yeah. man. All right, we should wrap it up. Uh, Roger and Brian, thank you. This was a lot of fun. Uh, folks, you can expect more of these in the future. Uh, we're going to get uh, our interview with Cardboard Computer, who made Kentucky Route Zero up in our podcast feed. We'll also get an interview with Kaizen Gameworks, who made uh, Paradise Killer, which we just recently reviewed. Um, 
I can almost guarantee you we'll record something on Cyberpunk 2077, uh, only half of which will be about crunch and about the state of the game industry being completely messed up. Um, we'll talk about the story at some point. Uh, but until then, uh, thanks for listening, and we'll be back. All right, I am stopping recording.